God bless you. Welcome. Hallelujah. Welcome to Transforming Word Ministries Tuesday Night Bible Study. I'm Apostle Marcos. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Before we begin, for those of you that may be joining with us for the very first time, I encourage you to get your Bible, get a pad, get a pen. Amen. Take notes. If you have any questions or anything that you'd like to share, please write it down because at the end of the Bible study, we will have a time for questions and answers and comments. So, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's get started, but first, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, hallelujah, for gathering us today, hallelujah. Despite the difficulties that I've had over the last couple of days, Lord, you have made a way. Father, I thank you for it. Lord, I ask, hallelujah, that you help my flesh decrease, that your spirit may increase, Father, and that you take full and firm control over this Bible study teaching tonight. Father, I pray that many are edified and that you are glorified in this process as we go forth this evening in your name, in your love, and in your power, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let us get started. Hallelujah. Those of you that have been joining with us, we're still in our series on church cliches. And tonight we are going to be talking about a topic that is sure to ruffle a few feathers, and that is on pride. Hallelujah. Now, there's an ugly truth that exists in Christendom today regarding the issue of pride, the many different aspects of pride and how it manifests itself. Now, while the scriptures often dictate it, or, or I should say describe it, yeah, describe it as an excessive self-esteem, which is also known as conceit, a main trait of pride is the mental blindness that accompanies it. That person cannot perceive their own fixation with self. Yet it's usually obviously, painfully obvious to those that are around them. And it results in an uncomfortable tension within that relationship dynamic. Simply, Pride relegates others to a lower social, a lower intellectual, and a, or even a lower economic status. And no one, of course, likes to be around people that downgrade the importance of their perspectives, their opinions, and their feelings. Now, there are three main words used in scripture that describe the characteristics of pride. And these are all attitudes that are expressed, which means that they come from the soul and that they are spiritual in nature. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. The first is pride or being proud. And that is having or displaying excessive self-esteem, and it may suggest an assumed superiority or an elevated status. Now note, there's nothing wrong with being proud or pleased of a child's accomplishments or taking pride in our appearance. That's a legalistic interpretation that takes this concept to an extreme, amen, because there's nothing wrong, like I said, with taking pride in how we present ourselves, presenting ourselves correctly, amen? Now, the second term is the word haughty, and I'm quite sure many of us have seen this in scripture. Haughty means blatantly and disdainfully proud, suggesting a, a conscience of superior birth or position. I'm better than you are. The third is the word arrogant, which means um, it shows exaggerating or disposed to exaggerate one's own worth 
or self-importance, implying a claiming for oneself of more consideration or importance that is warranted. Hallelujah. Now, there's a very familiar verse, one of many, that talks about the issue of pride. That's Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, which tells us pride goeth before destruction. And in this context, it's talking about like the destruction of a kingdom and a haughty spirit before a fall. And this word fall is, is, uh, can be translated as calamity, you know, not just tripping and falling on your face, but a calamity, something bad that happens. Hallelujah. So look at this. Destruction follows pride. The two are linked together as the effect, which is pride, and the after effect, which is destruction. This verse carries the idea of pride influencing our perspective and creating a kingdom of our own opinions. And that kingdom exalts the prideful person as king, and it competes with the kingdom of God for dominance. So wherever pride is, the destruction of our own little kingdom that is founded on that pride is not far behind. Now pay a close, uh, close attention to that concept, amen? Pride is associated with the kingdom of self. And most people are familiar, of course, with the five I wills of Lucifer, which eventually led to his fall. And this is found in Isaiah chapter 14. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to read verses 12 through 14. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Just keep in mind, I'm, I'm working with my laptop today, so I might not be able to see who's with us this evening. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Please just bear with me. Hallelujah. So I am I am apologizing in advance if I don't acknowledge you because I'm not able to see the names as they pop up. Next week, I'll be using my desktop again, so uh, that won't be an issue. Amen. Hallelujah. So now in Isaiah chapter 14, starting with verse 12, the prophet writes this, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, which indicates that his opinion you know, was in play and it then influenced his desire. He said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And as a result of all of this, I will be like the most high. Now we all know how that turned out. Lucifer was removed from his position of authority in the kingdom of God, and he has been slated for permanent removal from the presence of God, and that is, of course, through the lake of fire. His kingdom, known as the kingdom of Satan and also as the world, is also slated for destruction at the time the kingdom of God is to be set up here on earth. Pride is a characteristic of Lucifer, and the prideful person erects their own kingdom based on self. So this reveals that when pride is the foundation of that kingdom, destruction of that kingdom eventually follows. Hallelujah. Now, there are the obvious aspects of pride. But tonight, we're going to discuss two specific areas. 
the sins of presumption and competition. Webster's Dictionary defines presumption as overstepping proper boundaries without permission. For example, taking liberties in going beyond what is right or what is appropriate, especially in a way that is rude. Hmm. Let's use a, a, an, an everyday example. Um, one example of presumptuousness is, for example, going to an acquaintance's home for the first time and without being told that it was okay, putting our feet on their coffee table, taking it upon ourselves to raid the refrigerator, answer their phone, or even read their mail. It's the height of rudeness. Basic home training tells us that even though we're encouraged to make ourselves at home, we're not to conduct ourselves in another person's home as freely as we would in our own home. That, again, would be clearly overstepping proper boundaries without permission. And it's also a sign of disrespect. Now, in applying this principle to church conduct, it's inappropriate for anyone in ministry leadership or in a leadership position to assume that their authority in the church carries over into the homes of their congregation. It's presumptuous for them to assume that their church authority overrides the authority of the high priest of that home. This type of behavior, which is rooted in pride, the psalmist calls the presumptuous sin. So let us turn to Psalms 19. We're going to read verses 7 through 14. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God bless you. Oh, I see everybody now. God bless you, Brother Kenneth. Sister Lisa, welcome. Brother Charles, welcome. Hallelujah. Brother Raymond, Brother Thomas, Brother Albert. Sister Deb, welcome. Hallelujah. We are in Psalm 19, picking up with verse 7. The law of the Lord, and this is referring to Yahweh the Father, is perfect or complete, converting the soul. Now, let's pause there for a moment, because convert is the Hebrew word shub, and it means to return, to turn back. Now, this word is also translated into English as repent, where it carries the idea of returning back to the point where the error was made and then choosing the correct path. Now, anybody that's missed an exit on the highway understands this concept. Amen? If we miss our exit, you keep on going, you get off the next exit, you turn around, you go back to your original exit, and you get off and you continue going where you were going. It's the same exact principle. So God's laws, his commandments, or his instructions, if they are followed, are able to cause the habitually rebellious person to turn from a focus on self to perceiving what is right according to God's standards and applying those new standards. Let's continue finishing the balance of verse seven. The testimony of the Lord, which is what God declares to be truth as a person that has intimate knowledge of the truth, which God definitely does. The testimony of the Lord is sure meaning trustworthy and dependable, making wise the simple, which tells us that following God's principles is exercising godly wisdom. And though a person may seem gullible by society standards, using godly wisdom will make them appear wiser than they were ever given credit for. Verse eight, the statutes of the Lord are right or correct. Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, which is figurative meaning to be filled with God's spiritual illumination of the mind, where we begin to perceive things that are hidden to the unbeliever. 
Verse 9, the fear or the respect, the reverence of the Lord is clean. And that's in both the ceremonial sense and in a moral sense. Enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And that is absolutely true. We can't argue with scripture, even though more professed Christians today are interested in chasing after material wealth than being acknowledged by God as a good and faithful servant. And verse 11, moreover, by or through God's law and judgments, is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. Now, Paul and Peter both cite past acts of unrighteousness and the judgment received as examples of what not to do. Peter used the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Paul uses the example of the Israelites complaining against God in the wilderness. So in knowing what happened to them as a result of all of that, we're to learn from the mistakes of others. And that's the best way, to tell you the truth, to learn it's from the mistakes that other people make observing and seeing what happened to them and say, you know what? I'm not going to let that happen to me. I see what happened to them. I'm not going to do that. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Sister Rosemary. I'm sorry, my Sister Raylene. God bless you. Hallelujah. Geraldine, God bless you, Sister Sandra. Welcome. Hallelujah. Verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Now, secret faults are not faults that we're aware of and we try to keep a secret and keep it hidden from other people. Secret faults are shortcomings or issues that we may not even be aware of that tend to influence our emotions towards doing wrongful things. And the end result is usually the same. And you know what? Afterwards, we always ask ourselves, why does this keep happening to me? Well, that's because we keep making the same mistake and we're not honest enough with ourselves to admit that we're in error and that our behavior needs to change. An undesired result comes from an error made in the process. For example, if we cook a pot of stew and when we're eating it, we find out that it's too salty, the error was that we put in too much salt. Simple. See, now at that point, we're going to have to say to ourselves, well, you know, next time I'll add only half or maybe even a third as much. And that'll solve the problem. Everything will turn out all right. And that's because using the same amount of salt will only recreate the problem. There's a saying that those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. This means that if we fail to examine our behavior that led to the undesired result and change it if necessary, repeating that behavior will lead to the same result. Hmm. Verse 13, the psalmist continues and says, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Presumptuous is the Hebrew word zed, and it means arrogant, proud, swelling up, inflated, insolent. Uh, a, a Hebrew figure of speech puffed up. Same thing, inflating bigger than it really is. Now, the Adam Clark commentary tells us that presumptuous sins 
are not committed through frailty or surprise, but they're the offspring of thought, purpose, and deliberation. Hmm. So these are wrongs that are committed against others as a result of our own sense of superiority, ego, entitlement, and our own ignoring the limits of proper conduct. Let's continue that verse and finish it out. Let them not have dominion over me, these presumptuous sins. Let them not control me. Then shall I be upright, which is the Hebrew word tamam, and it means to be complete. And in this context, it means complete in mind and in heart. And I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Charles Cl um, Adam Clark defines the great transgression as habitual sinning, apostasy, and an easily besetting sin that is usually very unique to each individual. You know, it's our own little, what we can call quirks. The writer of Hebrews also addresses the same point about the easily besetting sin. In Hebrews chapter 11, to set it up, he goes down the list of the patriarchs that were deemed righteous as a result of their faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, etc. And chapter 11 ends with these two verses. Let's turn there. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to read verses 39 and 40 and go right into Hebrews chapter 12 because they're all one letter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. And these all, all of the people we just mentioned, having obtained a good report, how? Through faith, received not the promise, which was the manifestation of the Messiah in their lifetime, who we know as Jesus Christ. And that's because the appointed time of his arrival hadn't come yet. Verse 40. Having God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us or separated from the Jews in terms of faith. So now he's talking about unbelievers should not be made perfect or complete, whole or spiritually mature. Now let's go right into Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. He says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about or compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses, and these are the same people that he just spoke of in the previous chapter, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, on down the line, we're to apply their principles of faith to our lives. So because we have all of these witnesses that have shown us through their example, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So in other words, we're not to allow instances of uncontrolled emotions to hinder us, to lead us into habitual acts of sin. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So this means that the spiritual maturity that we are to attain to involves our learning to control our emotions. And in this context, it's in terms of pride and arrogance. And it also means accepting delayed gratification as opposed to demanding immediate gratification. This is what he talks about, let us run the race with patience. Mm. And this is a big problem in the body of Christ where we're not willing to wait for God to open the door of opportunity. Amen. We try to kick the door open. Scripture says that a man's gift will make room for him. But we have many that are operating in gifts that try to make room for their gift instead of letting God make that opportunity for them. So it's about 
not wanting any kind of gratification that you have to wait for, which is delayed gratification. It's I want it and I want it now. Hmm. Now, if we had a child that did that, we would see obviously that that is inappropriate. So why can't we see it when we do it ourselves? Hmm. Scripture tells us that it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things here and there that reveal degrees of spiritual immaturity. And if we indulge in it, that's what can defile us. Mm. Not only before God, but before other people that are watching us. Because we are being watched. Hallelujah. Now, let's turn to Psalm chapter 19. Hallelujah. Verse 14, specifically. And many like to tack this particular verse on at the end of a prayer. But let's look at the context. Psalm 19, verse 14 tells us, let the words of my mouth, which are the words that I speak, which Christ said in Matthew chapter 15 comes from the soul. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, which are the things my emotions want me to do, let them be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Mm. So Isaiah, before we even go on to Isaiah, Let's just take a look at that. Let the things that come out of my soul, my thoughts, my desires, and my will, what I want to do, let all of those things be acceptable to God. Well, there's really only one way that they can be acceptable to God, and that is if we make what we want to do the same thing that God wants. Make our will line up with God's will. And at that point, what we think, what we want, and what we choose to do, what we feel, will line up with God's will. And that's the reason why David, hallelujah, the psalmist, was a man after God's own heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Brother Tony Kim. Brother Ottaway, God bless you. Congratulations on your retirement. Hallelujah. Now, Isaiah, going to Isaiah chapter 13, amen. Isaiah re reveals what awaits the presumptuous, egotistic sinner that assumes an entitled privilege to overstep proper limits and boundaries. Now, Pay a close, close attention to the wording when we read it. Isaiah chapter 13, we're going to read verses 6 through 13. Amen? Hallelujah. Verse 6, the prophet writes, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Now, this is language that refers to the time of Christ's return in which the kingdom of God will be set up and judgment will be dispensed upon all unbelievers. This is what we are waiting for. Amen? It, referring to the day of the Lord, shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. That's how it can be recognized. Mm. Therefore shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt and they shall be afraid. Pangs, and sorrows, pay attention to the wording, shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. And this refers to childbirth. Pay attention to the wording. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, both cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And the land that he's referring to is Jerusalem 
And of course, this whole procedure is the abomination that causes desolation. And the Lord shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Verse 10, like I said, pay attention to the wording. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Now, of course, we know the moon doesn't have light of its own. It reflects light from the sun. Now, for those who study the scriptures, you should instantly recognize that this verse is repeated in Revelation chapter 6. Hold that place there in Isaiah. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 12 through 14. Hallelujah. God bless you, Sister Wanda. Sister Rosie, welcome. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. Look at this. This is what John saw in his vision. And I beheld when the Lamb had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Now, earthquake here is the Greek word seismos, you know, where we get seismology or seismic activity. Seismos, it means a shaking of the earth. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean the shifting of the tectonic plates that we know cause earthquakes, but it refers to something, anything that causes the earth to shake. Hmm. So there was a great earthquake, there was a great shaking going on, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Hmm, these two things follow that shaking of the earth. Now recently, there's been a big to-do made about these four blood moons and how they're prophetic and all of that. Well, you know what? Four blood moons have come and gone and nothing has happened. That's because people want to jump on the bandwagon because they know people are interested in things like this, especially in the events in the book of Revelation. People are interested in it. Some people are afraid. And people want to capitalize on coming up with some prophecies based on natural events that were happening. Four blood moons came and went, and we're still here waiting for Jesus to return. Mm. So evidently, this blood moon that is spoken of right here in Revelation chapter uh, 6 is not what these four blood moon prophecies was all about. It hasn't happened yet, and it's something totally different. Now, if we continue to read on forward, it explains what it is. Hallelujah. Verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now, remember that the book of Revelation is filled with symbols, and John described what he saw to the best of his limited understanding. These are not stars which are actually planets and galaxies, but they had the appearance of bright little lights falling to the earth. Hmm. It's the Greek word aster, which is where we get our word asteroid. So they're not stars, hallelujah. Little lights, bright little lights falling to the earth. Continuing verse 13, even as a fig casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now, we must remember to envision this event as it's described in our spiritual mind's eye. Amen? First, something causes the earth to shake. Then following the shaking, something else causes the sun's light to be obscured, and it changes the appearance of the moon's light from our perspective. Verse 14, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. 
Now, this word heaven refers to the stars in the sky that we see from our vantage point here on Earth. Remember, at that time, space travel was non-existent. So John could only be describing what he saw from the ground looking up towards the sky. Now, if we visualize the sky being like a scroll and the stars being like the writing on that scroll, and our view of those stars gradually diminishing like a scroll being rolled shut, we can see that something is gradually spreading. Hmm. I mean, if, if I'm looking at the sky right now, something is gradually spreading and blocking our view. If you can envision that, amen? It will block the view of the stars from the earth. And whatever is causing this will also block our view of the sun and it will change the appearance of the moon. Therefore, the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky are really unaffected, but our view of them is. Now, the prophet Joel also talks about this same scene on the day of the Lord, same time period. In your own personal study time, read Joel, and in verse 30, look up the word using a concordance that's translated as the word pillars. Very, very important word. Yules, I really didn't want to. I wanted to kind of like let you find it on your own, but I still encourage you to do that. But this word pillars, I'll just go ahead and tell you. If you look up the word, it means columns that spread out at the top like a palm tree. Don't take my word for it. Look it up yourself. You'll see it. Columns that spread out at the top like a palm tree. Mm. Now, if we put all of these accounts together, you may be also able to perceive that it describes a nuclear attack on Jerusalem in our future. Which is how I knew that these four blood moons had nothing to do with this book of Revelation. Just because the moon was red doesn't mean it's the same. This is why I told you as we were going forth, pay attention to the wording. <clears throat> Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 13. And we're going to finish it out with verses 11 through 13. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. Pastor Richard, God bless you. Hallelujah. Welcome. Brother Raymond, brother Michael, God bless you, brother Jackie. Man, oh, God bless you, brother Will. Welcome. Hallelujah. We're still in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11. God says, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, which is lawlessness, refusal to be governed by any existing law. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud, and this is that same word, Zed, which is translated as presumptuous. I will cause that to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Now, <clears throat> I've taken a lot of time to explore this word presumptuous because there are a lot of Christians that behave this way. And I make a distinction between Christians and true believers of Christ. Hallelujah. There are people who 
will start a church presuming that they're entitled to be supported by their congregation. And it really grieves me when I see people in leadership that feel entitled to, I guess what we can describe as an overstepping of authority, such as dictating how their congregation spends their personal time or even what they choose to name their children. Why do some people feel the need for an armor bearer? These armor bearers are really being used as personal servants to carry their Bibles, their books, their briefcase, and sometimes even to do their laundry and their dry cleaning. The spiritual armor that God has given each of us, as we learned last week, must be applied and used by us individually. So no one can carry our armor for us. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And remember, if you remember our teaching from last week, a stack of Bibles is not our spiritual armor. In a nutshell, faith used in various applications is our armor. So why do we need an armor bearer? Hmm. Now, in addition, many will justify this behavior by misusing a couple of scriptures, which are more cliches. The first is, and I'm quite sure many people have heard it, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. But if we read the entire passage, we'll see who is being spoken about and the context, which is very, very important. The way it's meant, not the way we choose for it to mean. Let's turn to Psalms 105, and we're gonna read verses seven through 19. Psalm 105, hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you, Sister Yvonne. I wanna thank all of you Hallelujah for choosing to spend your time with us this evening as we journey through the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 105, picking up with verse 7. The psalmist says, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all are in all the earth. God has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations which covenant he made with Abraham. So now we know we're talking about the Abrahamic covenant and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Now, pausing there, this verse doesn't mean that the Mosaic law was to last forever. Remember, Jacob and Israel were the same person. Jacob symbolized the old man, the immature, the corrupt man, while Israel symbolizes the new man, the spiritually mature and complete man. The corrupt man was given the law which outlined the righteous standards of God. And these same righteous standards are applied in the eternal covenant with the, the spiritually mature, under the umbrella of agape or unconditional love. Hallelujah. Continuing verse 11, saying unto Israel, will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance? Verse 12, so when, and we're talking about the family of Jacob, were but a few men in number, yea, very few and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, here we go, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He break the whole staff of bread. Verse 17, God sent a man before them, even Joseph, so now we know the time period, who was sold for a servant, 
whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried or tested him, referring to Joseph. Hmm. So the prophets and the anointed referred to is Israel, not the church. We just saw it in scripture. However, many today, again, like I said, will hide behind this scripture as a shield in order to discourage the examination of their behavior, which is pride. Now, the second scripture is yet another familiar one. That's found in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 58. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother Kevin. Welcome. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1, hallelujah, where the prophet says, or God, the prophet is told, cry aloud, spare not, how many have heard that phrase, amen, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. That just told us the context right there. By reading the previous chapter, we learned that Isaiah was sent to sent by God to expose the hypocrisy of Israel towards God. However, there are some today that will use this scripture in presuming to take the authority to rebuke others according to their standards and not according to God's standards. Hmm. For example, they'll say things like, you're a carnal Christian if you like to listen to jazz, if you like to listen to Motown or classic rock. You're a carnal Christian if you like going to the movies or to football games. You're a carnal Christian if you don't pray three times a day like David did, et cetera. Not David, Daniel. Sorry, <laughs> still on my mind. Hallelujah. But it's things like that. Now, an important reminder for all of us New Testament believers is that if scripture doesn't forbid a particular action, it then becomes a matter of personal preference. If God doesn't say, don't do this, then it's allowable to be done. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, going to the extreme and, you know, something crazy. We're just talking about, you know, if God doesn't say, don't use blue cheese dressing, if he doesn't say not to, then you're allowed to. It's, it's really simple. Let's just really keep it simple. Another example, God forbid Israel from eating foods like pork and shellfish and, you know, uh, any animal that had a, a cloven foot, which means it had a split hoof like camels. Amen. Even pigs. They were forbidden from eating animals like that. But that requirement was never put on any other nation. It was only given to Israel. And Galatians chapter 3 verse 19 tells us that the Mosaic law was to expire when the Messiah arrived, which is Jesus Christ. So therefore, the dietary restriction placed on Israel are no longer binding. In addition, those restrictions were never placed on the church, never. So we arrive at this conclusion. Believers of Christ are allowed to eat whatever we want. I mean, of course, that is depending on our own particular health situation. I mean, if you're diabetic, eating strawberry cheesecake is not a good idea, but you're allowed to, knowing that with everything we do, there are consequences. Sometimes the consequences are good and sometimes they're not. But we're allowed to eat whatever we want. So whether it's pork or crab legs, lobster tails, or we can choose not to if we want. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom. So if it's all a matter of personal preference. Therefore, no one has the authority to dictate what Christians should or should not eat using the law as the scripture reference. But there are plenty of people out there that do this. Now, granted, 
They say they don't eat pork because pigs are disgusting animals. And that is absolutely true. You know, they'll eat whatever. They roll around in mud. Of course, they've got, you know, bacteria in their flesh. However, if we cook it properly, there's nothing wrong with pork meat. There really isn't. The problem is if it's undercooked. But you have that same problem with chicken or with turkey or with fish. Amen. Hallelujah. So if it becomes a personal preference and person A doesn't like pork for whatever reasons, because they don't like the characteristics of the animal, fine. But if person B likes pork, regardless of the characteristics of the animal, because once it's properly cooked, it can be pretty tasty because sausage tastes good. Bacon tastes good. I happen to be a big fan of pernil. If anybody can give a hallelujah for pernil, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> but I do like some pernil, but that's a whole nother story. Amen. Hallelujah. So the thing is, we're all allowed to make our own free choices. In cases where God says, do not do this, then we must obey the Lord. But in cases where God doesn't say you're not allowed to do that, then we're allowed. And again, it becomes a matter of personal preference. But presumptive behavior in saying, this is what the, the, the word says, so therefore we're not allowed to do it. Even though that is taken out of context and these dietary restrictions were given to Israel and Israel alone, Presumptive behavior like that often spirals into fanaticism. Fanaticism is not a good thing. A religious fanatic will often be excessively enthusiastic and they'll employ hypercritical standards. I mean, standards that even they themselves can't keep. And if they do try to keep it, of course, it's a huge struggle. Mm their tendency to go to extremes and their belief that those who don't go to the same extremes are carnal Christians is often the cause of frustration within the body of Christ and the ridicule of Christianity itself. Hmm. Like I said, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Scripture gives us an example, believe it or not, of presumptuous behavior just like this involving two young disciples of Christ named James and John, who along with Peter were part of Jesus's inner circle. You know, anytime Christ was going somewhere important, the other disciples stayed behind and Peter, James, and John went with him. Mount of Transfiguration, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, and many other places in Scripture. Well, let's take a look at this particular event involving James and John. Let's turn to Luke chapter 9. We're going to read verses 51 through 56. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Kevin, Brother Darius, Sister Margaret. Welcome. Hallelujah. Verse 51. And it came to pass... When the time was come that Jesus should be received up, in other words, it was time for him to um, be crucified, he steadfastly set his face, or he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And Jesus sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And the Samaritans, did not receive Jesus because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. In other words, because Jesus was clearly going to go to Jerusalem and not to them. So they said, well, you, you don't want to come here? Fine, go. We don't want you. Verse 54, and when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, Will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Now, of course, they're referring to the event involving Elia, 
the prophet against the 400 prophets of Baal during the time of Jezebel and Ahab. Amen. That battle on Mount Carmel. That's what they're referring to. Notice also that neither of them asked Jesus what he was going to do about that. Mm. In plain English, James and his brother John wanted to execute those who rejected Jesus. What does that sound like to you? It's a fanaticism that was later repeated in Nazi Germany when they exalted Adolf Hitler and the master race over the rights of the citizens. And this was no different. James and John wanted to force the Samaritans to accept Jesus upon threat of death. That's what happened. Verse 55. But Jesus turned and rebuked James and John and said, you know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Now, note the lower case S. It's talking about human spirit. So Jesus is saying, you don't realize what kind of attitude is influencing you. And that brought a sharp rebuke from Christ. Verse 56. And here Jesus now tells them the flaw in their thinking. He said, for or because the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives. And lives is the Greek word suke, which means the soul. It's where we get our English word psyche, amen? He said, I've not come to destroy men's lives or their souls, but to save them. And they went to another village. Again, suke, which means soul, is where we get our English word psyche. And it's the intellectual part of us that thinks and reasons. It's the mind. Jesus did not come to destroy souls that reject him, but to provide them with the opportunity to save them through the gospel. And as we've covered many times, the gospel is the invitation to the kingdom of God extended to sinful mankind. And that's why it's good news. James and John exhibited fanaticism fueled by ego, elitism, and religion. And this is dangerous because that leads to pride, which leads to arrogance and the presumptive entitlement to punish those that don't agree with our opinions. Mm. It becomes an attitude of superiority when our personal policies and opinions are to be blindly accepted without question. Any congregation that embraces this kind of philosophy is not a church, it's a cult. Just gonna put it right out there, amen? Now, while we're talking about John, the other aspect of pride that we're gonna discuss is the spirit or the attitude of competition. Oh yeah, there's a lot of that going on in the church too. Here, competition, this whole attitude is described by Paul as being a product of the corrupt human nature and scripture identifies or describes it as emulations, which is rivalry. Hmm. After Jesus asks Peter three times if he loved him, many of us are very familiar with that passage of scripture. And then when he tells Peter to feed his sheep, Jesus then reveals how Peter was going to die, which was through crucifixion. Peter was crucified upside down. Amen. Let's turn to John chapter 21. I'm going to pick up with verse 19. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 19. This spake Jesus, signifying by what death Peter should glorify God. And when Jesus had spoken this, he saith unto Peter, follow me. 
In other words, adopt the example of my character into your lifestyle and into your ministry. Verse 20, then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Now, of course, this was John the disciple, who was the youngest disciple. He's the author of the Gospel of John, the first, second, and third epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. Verse 21, Peter, seeing John, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Hmm. Jesus saith unto Peter, if I will that John tarry till I cometh, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Now let's take a look at this word tarry and the phrase, is that too? Tarry is the Greek word meno, and in this context, it's a reference to time in terms of the human lifespan. So we're talking about chronological time. Is that too is a Greek phrase, or it's actually one word. It's the word pros, and it means with regard to or concerning. So Jesus' response was a pretty strong rebuke because he basically tells Peter, if I want John to physically live until I return to establish my kingdom, what does that have to do with you? What concern is that of yours? Unless you're to work together, what I tell John or anyone else to do or how to do it has no bearing on you. So focus on what I've called you to do. Hmm. I mean, text betrays emotion. We just know what Jesus said, but we have no idea the way he said it. But once we break down the words and understand the context and the meanings of these words, we could understand that not only <laughs> should Peter have been embarrassed, but that was something that he needed. Peter was always the first to talk. Sometimes he spoke too much. And this was one occasion where he overstepped his boundaries and put his foot in his mouth. And Jesus had to check him and put him in his place. Now, this same principle can be directly applied to the individual members of the body of Christ who take it upon themselves to criticize and correct the way that others op operate in their ministry calling. Some people like to move in an unstructured format and refer to it as prophetic worship. Some people, like myself, prefer to have structure while leaving plenty of room for the Holy Spirit to add anything he wants whenever he wants. Others prefer to plan ministry service from beginning to end and follow a strict schedule. And this is especially, you know, like if they have time limits in the location where they're at, you know, if they're sharing a, a building and they're only there for two hours. You can't go over time because there's another ministry coming in right behind you. So in cases like that, I can understand that as well. Some people learn better through listening. Some prefer visual aids and diagrams, and others would just rather read. That's the best way that they learn. Some believe that we should worship on Sunday, some on Saturday, and others on any day of the week. See, the whole point is that no one should dictate their idea of the right way that others should move in ministry. As Paul illustrates in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, using the physical body as the example, he says the eyes and the hands are both part of the human body and both operate differently for the benefit of the entire body. Now, both, for example, both can perceive the presence of fire, but the hand 
feels it while the eye sees it. The eye can't dictate how the hand is to naturally operate and vice versa. So now when we see it from this particular perspective, it becomes ridiculously obvious. Yet we have so many who will authorize themselves to dictate how others should operate in ministry. And not only how they should be used, but the area that they should be used in. Hmm. What God tells a member of the body of Christ to do and how he anoints them to do it is between God and that person. Let the hand be the hand. Let the eye be the eye. And don't try to force the eye to be the foot. As we've just seen, Jesus rebuked Peter for being concerned about the ministry business of another person that he himself was not called to. Stay in your lane, Peter. Don't worry about this one. You might think this is the way that God has anointed you to function. You do things this way. As long as you achieve the goal and respect and represent God properly, it's all good. But don't think that we have the right, because we do things this way, to tell the next person who may do things this way that they're wrong. If God has anointed them to operate that way, and they're representing God, they're honoring God, and they're producing fruit for the kingdom of God, that's how they operate. Stay in your lane. Mm. Now, of course, today there's also a disgraceful attitude of competition. Churches competing with other churches in terms of membership and even choir competitions. I could never understand it. The McDonald's choir competition where you got choirs from all over the country all trying to outdo each other singing. Really? Is that bringing God glory? Is it? Churches competing with other churches in terms of membership. It's ridiculous. Thinking more in terms of numbers than in terms of discipleship. Granted, you know, you can have 5,000 people visit your ministry in one year. But if you've got a revolving door where that 5,000 comes in and they go out and they don't come back in again, the ministry is not growing. All they did was visit for a week, one day, but none stayed, none were discipled, and there was no increase. Maybe they were called to go to another ministry. You know, uh, somebody planted and somebody else watered, but God gives the increase. Big problem is that we are relying on gimmicks to get people into the church as opposed to a heavy focus on the word of God so people understand, breaking it down into small pieces so they can comprehend it and apply it to their lives, amen? People can't live on milk forever. When we were babies, we could deal with milk. But when we became teenagers, and you know how teenagers love to eat, amen? You would starve to death if all you were given was milk. So you can't raise disciples to remain spiritual children. We have to train them to become men and women of God. Yeah, you just get saved, you're a child of God, but you're not expected to stay a child of God. We're all expected to grow and become men and women of God, which indicates maturity, amen? So there has to be a heavy uh, focus on the word of God. Because as you can see right there, amen, it is the word that transforms us into the image of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we can't rely on gimmicks and just simple basics of Christianity and expect our churches to grow and then feel envious because the church down the block has got 300, 400, 500 members. And we're still with the first 20 that we started with. 
Mm. Mm. There's even members com co competing with other members in the same church to sing better, dance better, write better songs, preach the loudest, preach the hardest. For what? That brings attention to self. Amen. It's not focusing attention on God and leading everybody into the presence of God. It's focusing on self. You know, and this reminds me of that old song that goes, anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Mm. You know, I looked that up and I found out that it was from a 1946 Broadway play called Annie Get Your Gun. You can find it on YouTube. The two main characters, and I've never seen the movie, I've never seen the play, but the two main characters were in a competition trying to outdo the other. Hmm, the male and the female. And instead, you know, outdoing each other, trying to best the other one so they can brag, instead of just accepting the other person for who and what they are. Now, there are various signs of pride, and I've gathered this from desiringgod.org, and I hopefully this will bless a lot of people. I hope it does. The various signs of pride, they listed a lot, but I'm just going to give a few. Rejecting the truth and hating correction or admitting when we're wrong. Refusing to allow for opinions that are different from our own. In other words, they can't agree to disagree. And every disagreement they view as a personal attack on them. Mm. Finding fault with other people, but ignoring our own faults, which what Jesus talked about. How are you going to talk about the splinter in your brother's eye, but you got a big old log in yours? Mm. Being desperate for attention. You know, everything is always about them being the center of attention. Being legalistic, which is interpreting everything in a strictly literal sense instead of allowing for figurative usage. I mean, for example, you know, we could say that Paul kicked the bucket. Now we would know that is, I mean, literally you would envision a man kicking a pail. However, we know that it's a figure of speech. It means that he died. Hmm. Unforgiveness, another sign of pride. And selfishness, being focused only on our own needs and our own wants and ignoring others. These are all signs of pride. Now let's turn to 1 John chapter 2, keeping an eye on the time. We're going to read verses 15 and 16. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Jeremiah. Brother Kenneth, welcome. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, and here world is the Greek word cosmos, and it refers to corrupt human society that rejects God. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world or in corrupt human society, which John, uh, John then identifies as the lust of the flesh, which is the uncontrolled desires of the corrupt human nature, and the lust of the eyes, which is the uncontrolled desire for what we see, and the pride of life, and that's the Greek phrase, alatsoneia bios, alatsoneia bios. And it means quite simply, empty bragging about this course of life, referring to our livelihood, our living, bragging about how much we got it going on. I got this kind of car. I got this kind of paper. I can buy anything that I want, all the bling on my fingers. That's the pride of life. All of that, John says, is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So in closing, 
If pride causes us to exalt ourselves, to exalt our opinions and our desires over all others, that makes pride a form of idolatry. And idolatry is not a little statue that people keep in their closet and that they pray to. It can be that too, but it's not limited to that. Idolatry is when we place the utmost love, trust, importance, and authority in anything other than God. When pride leads us to make our own opinions more authoritative than God's opinion, that's idolatry. And that's what Paul talks about when he talks about the stronghold of the mind, amen? The fortress built around the mind that exalts its own ideas above and against the knowledge of God. This is why the prideful person can't perceive their own error, and that makes it a very dangerous trap of the enemy for anybody to fall into. So what we need to do is check our attitudes, re-examine them, re-examine our motives. Why are we doing this thing or that thing? Hmm. What is our motive? Are we trying to make a name for ourselves? Are we trying to um, develop a reputation? Or are we trying to serve God? If we are the primary benefit or beneficiary, I should say, of the things that we do, that is pride. And it's idolatry because we're not serving God. We're pretending to serve God, but really what we're doing is we are serving ourselves. Pride. And where pride goeth, destruction follows right behind it. Mm. I recently saw a phrase online that really blessed me, and I, I hope that it blesses everybody too. And the phrase is this, the center of sin and pride is I. Selah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we love you and honor you for giving us your Holy Spirit as our teacher, our counselor, as our mentor, as our schoolmaster, hallelujah, that teaches us and corrects us in controlling our emotions and exhibiting your characteristics and your qualities of love and honor for one another, hallelujah, patience for one another, respect for one another. Mm. Father, if there's anything inside any of us, Father, that is displeasing to you, Father, we ask that you not just take it out of us, but that you reveal it to us so that we can see it for ourselves and resolve to remove it ourselves. Because if something is taken away from us against our will, because of the corrupt nature that we all have, we're going to chase it down and we're going to try and take it back. So if there's anything in us, Father, reveal it to us and show us the ugliness of it so that we'll throw it out and keep it out and replace it with the beauty of your holiness. And Father, I pray that this teaching blesses someone, Father, that it turns someone into the right path if they're out of the right path, and if they're in the right path, that it keeps them in the right path. First and foremost, me. And Father, I thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory. Love, hallelujah, world without end, name above all names, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Amen. Well, this concludes our Bible study for this evening. Hallelujah. I want to thank all of you. God bless you, Brother Jose, that joined with us this evening. If we have anybody that has any questions or comments that they would like to contribute, please type it in in the comment section. We will get to all of them, I promise. Hallelujah. I'm going to scroll back and see if there are any comments. Hallelujah. Sister Rosie says, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Sister Raylene says, hi. God bless you. Sister Deb says, hey. All right. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if anybody called in late, this is our closing information. Amen. And missed any part of this, don't worry about it. It's recorded. You can watch it anytime you want on Facebook as soon as we log off. But you can also watch it at our website, which is transformingwordnyc.org. Amen. You can watch the teaching in its entirety, along with all the other teachings from our current series on church cliches, as well as our previous series on the parables of Christ. Amen. And this teaching will also be uploaded to our YouTube ministry page. Just put in a search for Transforming Word Ministries. Subscribe while you're there. So if you miss it on Tuesday night, you can easily find it on YouTube. Amen. All I ask is that you help me share these teachings so that we can continue to edify the body of Christ. And you can do that by sharing the link for this video, share the link for our uh, ministry website, as well as our YouTube page. Amen. I was in Facebook jail again last week. You know why guilty as charged. Amen. But I could use your help. Hallelujah. In reaching out to as many people as we can. If you want to hold, use this teaching as a watch party on your timeline or in whatever group that you may be in on Facebook, please feel free to do so. Amen. Share it with as many places people in places as you can, other social media websites like MeWe, Gab, Twitter, you name it. The whole idea is not to build Transforming Word Ministries, but to build and edify the body of Christ with the time that we have remaining. Amen. And I could certainly, and I would definitely appreciate your help. And in addition, I want to give a thank you to all of those that, um, choose to honor the Lord by supporting this ministry financially. Amen. There are a couple of you out there that have made donations to help keep this ministry going. Amen. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Amen. I, I, I praise God for you. Amen. And I praise, I, I hope that I am being some kind of a blessing to you. Amen. You know who you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you, Sister Janice. Welcome. Well, we're closing in on the top of the hour. If we don't have anybody that have any questions or comments, amen. I know people got to get up early in the morning. Hallelujah. Some people don't. Not bragging, because that would be prideful. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Hallelujah. Well, I want to, again, thank everyone who joined with us this evening, even if it was just for a few minutes. God bless you. Hallelujah. We will be back, God willing, next Tuesday, which should be October 8th. Amen. This year is coming to a close pretty quick. Amen. We're going to be back next Tuesday, October 8th, with our next teaching uh, in our current series on church cliches. Hallelujah right here on Transforming Word Ministries Tuesday Night Bible Study. Please invite a friend to join you. Again, feel free to share this link for this video on your timeline with as many people as you desire. Amen. Again, I just want to thank everybody for joining with us this evening and not considering it a waste of your time as we journey through the Word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. One last check before we go. Amen. Well, if we don't have any more questions, no more comments, God bless you. Amen. We'll be back again next Tuesday, again, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. So if you live in a different time zone, 
please make sure to take that into consideration so as not to miss anything. But if you do, don't worry about it. It's recorded. Amen. So God bless you all. Everybody have a blessed evening, a blessed week. And remember, until we meet again, mm, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Again, this is Transforming Word Ministries Tuesday Night Bible Study. I'm Apostle Marcos. Have a blessed evening. Good night, everybody.